Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Let's get started. So, as usual, I'd like to thank um, the Atkinson Center for sponsoring the seminar series. And today is my really great honor to present Ram Ramanathan. And Ram has a, um, well, he's affiliated here at Cornell University in CALS and also at UCSD. And he has a very long history of achievements in both science and air pollution, both activism and, and research. Way too many achievements for me to go over now. I'll just give a few highlights. So in the 1970s, Ram discovered that CFCs, the gas that destroys ozone in the stratosphere, has a huge impact on global warming as a, um, about 10,000 times as much as CO2. So the Montreal Protocol, a very a successful international treaty that essentially saved the ozone layer, also mitigated climate change by controlling CFCs. And this is probably the first treaty that acted to mitigate climate change on an international scale. Once worked extensively on the impacts of clouds and aerosols and on the atmospheric radiation budget and has done a lot of work on the Asian brown cloud that impacts Southeast Asia. With his daughters, he has led and founded Project Surya, which is an effort to mitigate the very health, very serious health and climate impacts of cooking on solid biomass. Indoor cooking um, impacts many, many people throughout India and Africa and mitigating these emissions not only helps their health, but also impacts climate change. There are many, he has many other accolades. He was the science advisor for Pope Francis the whole, in the, for the Holy See delegation to the 2015 Climate Summit. He's been elected to the US National Academy of Science. He's won the Tyler Prize for Environmental Achievement and the Tang Prize for Sustainability. So it's a great pleasure to welcome Ram here to give a talk. And thanks Ram for giving us a talk today. Thank you, Peter. Can you hear me? We're good. So you can hear me now? Yes. Yep. All right, great. Let me know when I should start. Okay, uh, I'm assuming all of you can hear me. And, and thanks to Peter for this invitation and the opportunity to talk to all of you. I give many, many, many talks, too many, but I'm still most inspired when I talk to students because I am always looking for suggestions from you. So that if you see uh, the title of my talk, Bouncing Back from the Climate Crisis, just to give you a 30 second history, I, when I got into this field in 1974, there were just about 10 or 12 of us worldwide working on this problem. And uh, we used to call it a greenhouse effect. Then after 10, 15 years, uh, after the 70s, it became clear there was huge uh, public implication. So uh, the name was changed to global warming. Then by year 2000, it, it was becoming clearer that this greenhouse effect was just not about warming, but changing of everything in the planet. So it became greenhouse effect, global warming to climate change. And what we all witnessed in the last 20 years is the tremendous amount of uh, intense uh, weather events. So I, I think it's about time to change it from climate change to climate crises. So that's what I'm going to talk to you about. How do we get out of this? In a perfect world, all we have to do to solve the problem is pursue the common good. We take steps to protect each other and everyone in the planet. And we take steps to protect the lives and the living 
of generations yet to be born. But unfortunately, we are not in that perfect world. So let me uh, give you a little bit background on uh, where we are. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So this is the current status. You know, this cartoon was drawn by a Cambridge University cartoonist after he heard my talk and he summarized it beautifully this way. So what I show here is of course the planet in a human form holding many cards. On the left is science. What the science is telling us is that we still have time, about 10 years to get our act together and bend that emissions curve so that we can bend the warming curve, okay? So the message from the science is the game is not over. On the solution side, there are tens to hundreds of solutions. So we are not solving this problem, not because we lack solutions, okay? And the solutions, of course, uh, require money. How much? One estimate uh, by the International Monetary Fund, and I think probably World Bank too, is that it's going to cost about $3,000 billion a year for the next 15 years, or three trillion for the next 10, 15 years. And it's the lack of resources why we are not solving the issue. And then you ask why, this is my personal view, we just don't have the public support, okay? If you doubt my words, just go around the campus and talk to even faculty or students you will see that many would acknowledge, yeah, climate change is an issue. But if you really ask them, what is, where should we spend our money? Climate solution would not be on the top one to three. Uh, for many, not for all of them, for many. So what we need is public support, okay? And I'm gonna to talk to you about that. And the other issue I'm gonna to talk to you about is on the solution side. If you look at all the reports until about five years ago, they mainly talk about solution to the climate change problem is one of mitigation, that is bending the curve of emissions of these heat trapping pollutants. Now, what's being advanced, and I strongly, strongly support that, is that we have to broaden our approach from uh, just mitigation to building resilience. And, and I'll tell you later what that resilience means and what it, it involves, okay? So that's the background I wanna give. So I wanna talk, I'm gonna to talk to you about broadening our approach to uh, the solutions issue and then go on to the public support, okay? So I'm gonna, Condense. I used to give a one semester, one quarter course on climate science. I, I'm condensing that to just one slide because I don't want to spend my time on the science. I see from previous talks, many experts at Cornell have talked to you about this. So let me just summarize this. The planet is surrounded by, like a blanket, many heat trapping pollutants. Okay, and don't get me wrong, uh, you need, the nature has given us a blanket of water vapor and carbon dioxide, which is why keeping the planet habitable. So the greenhouse effect by itself is not bad, okay? So how does it operate? This, think of this nature given greenhouse gases, water vapor and carbon dioxide, as a blanket. How does the blanket keep you warm on a cold winter night? The blanket doesn't give any heat to you. It just traps your body heat and prevents it from escaping to the colder room outside. That's exactly what uh, the greenhouse gases do. They trap the infrared heat coming from the planet and the atmosphere. But what we have done 
is added to the added to the thickness of the blanket which nature gave us how much first let's talk about carbon dioxide you know it's major source of it is fossil fuel combustion anything we burn including wood but fossil fuels mainly ultimately converts to carbon dioxide because after all fuel is hydrocarbons carbon and hydrogen and they and the combustion releases it, the carbon, and the carbon combines with the oxygen to become carbon dioxide. Since 1750, onset of the steam engine, the industrial age, we have emitted, believe it or not, 2,200 billion tons. That's about 2.2 trillion tons. And we are now adding about 38 billion tons every year. Just to give you the sheer magnitude of this, the entire solid waste in the planet, okay? All nations, all human beings, 8 billion human beings, our solid waste is about one to 2 billion. So the junk we throw into the air is about 30 times more, okay? About half of the 2,200 billion tons have been removed by the land, you know, uh, the vegetation, the oceans, etc. cetera. So today, today that blanket is about 1,000 billion tons. Maybe it's about 1,100, but let's just round it off. So that's how massive that blanket is, okay? It's equivalent to 500 years of solid waste. We don't. So the... Unfortunately, you can't see gases with your eyes. You can only see particles. You can see liquid, but you can't see gases. That's why this problem is not visible to us. In spite of the magnitude of how thick it is, thousand billion tons, carbon dioxide is only about 50% of the problem. The other 50% come from numerous other heat trapping pollutants like methane, nitrous oxide, ozone, and the list is long, okay? So that's in the nutshell is the science. When we take, when you take this school bus from Ithaca and go to Syracuse, say, and if it's a fossil fuel bus, about half of everything you emit stays for centuries at least 100 years, and 20% of it stays for 1,000 years. That is why it circumvents the entire planet like a blanket. Keep one thought in mind. Emission like COVID, infection any corner of the planet is a pandemic. These gases emitted no matter where any corner of the planet warms the entire planet. Okay, So we have to bring the world together to solve this problem. So what's happened in the last 20 years is that we have seen the warming of the planet leading to new weather extremes. I'm just summarizing the IPCC, you would have seen it. So what are the weather extremes? Extreme heat, heavy rainfall, drought, fire weather. There is also uh, hurricanes. We don't know to what extent this tornado disaster we had the you know, most of Midwest and Southwest and parts of the East Coast is going through is due to climate change, but they're also pretty intense, okay? And the American Meteorological Society, which is where most physical climate scientists, they belong to the society, and they concluded we are witnessing new weather extremes because we have made a new climate. Okay, so that's not in doubt. And I just give the long laundry list of how the extremes have increased. I'm not going to go through this. You can look at my slide. But 4.1 billion people in the planet have been displaced. So it's not something locally or hearing. It's a global scale phenomenon. But just the disaster numbers increased by a factor of five since the time I got into this field in the 1970s to now, okay? So all well documented, the issues we don't have to debate. So one thing I wanna to talk to you about today throughout is resilience. Okay, how do we build climate resilience? 
So I just want to draw this diagram. This is something we in California are going through. Our forest fires have gone from, you know, thousand acres burning to million acres burning all at once. Okay, about thirty percent of the forest we have lost. So, how does it impact the resilience? See, look at that feedback loop I put. Warming go vertically down, no horizontally. You heat the atmosphere it becomes drier. So more vapor uh, escapes from the soil. So the soil dries and you lost this. You dry the soil, you dry the trees and you get the forest fires. And more forest fires, the, the roots are not holding the water. So we have drama, it causes drought. On the left-hand side, what's also happening is the warming as the air is warming, less of the precipitation is falling as snow in our mountains. You know, rain runs off, but as the snow stays for two, three months. So as a result, there is a same forest drying runoff drought, okay? So nature is slowly losing its resilience. And, and I want to keep you, keep you to keep this resilience issue. So you can ask, can this get any worse? Unfortunately, it can. It's from a statistical phenomenon called fat tails. When somebody tells you, IPC poll, the planet is going to warm up by two degrees, because they're trying to condense, they don't tell you, none of us can definitively say anything is going to happen. Everything is probability. There's a probability distribution. So when IPCC says the planet is going to warm by two degrees, there is a 5% probability that it could be less than one and a half, which will be good for us. On the other hand, there is a 5% probability the warming can be two to three times large. You see on the right-hand side, that's what is called, it doesn't sharply reduce to zero or out two, it has a fat tail. And they're narrowing it down. Scientists have narrowed it down. It's up, you know, two to six degrees. They've said it's going to be, you know, if it's say two, it'll be probably four degrees. Okay. So what's the difference? Two, there is some chance we can bounce back from it, adapt. Four degrees by every measure of opinion, it's a catastrophe, okay? And posing existential threats. So there is always this seeming threat looming behind. So whenever I give a number, keep it in your mind that there is this distribution that there's a fat tail. So uh, look at that graph I have. It shows how the warming is going to pro progress. IPCC, which is the International Panel for Climate Change, thousands of scientists work on this. They recently released a report over the last two years. They said in two, when they released a report in around 2008, that we have crossed the one and a half degree warming by about two, around 2015, which I agree with. And they said, we're gonna cross one and a half by 2040. We published a study uh, four years ago, five years ago, 2018, showed no, because of the pace of the warming and the emissions, it's likely to happen 2030, which is just seven years away. By many measures, one and a half degree warming is a potentially a threshold for dangerous climate change. Although the word dangerous is subjective, it's not objective. So that's why I'm calling this, we are in the climate crisis. When we cross in one and a half degree, seven years from now, and I'm hoping I'll be still alive so I can verify my prediction, but who could tell? I'm claiming, I'm about 50% certain it's gonna happen. It could be delayed by one or two years. Instead of 2030, it could be 2032 because of naturally, the climate change will transition to climate disruption worldwide. And that's why I'm saying it's best to call it climate crises, okay? So in my mind, 
we have about seven to 10 years. That's where my seven to 10 years come from, okay? We got to bend that emission curve of heat trapping pollutants by that time. So just wanna give you a flavor of the global nature of this. This is the actual measurements of drought in 2015. 14% of the land area and severe to extreme. Just look at the whole area I live in, of California, West Coast, the entire West Coast. Look at the Amazon, where the Brazil is, and most of Africa, and uh, Southern Europe, entire Mediterranean region, and China, et cetera, et cetera. I'm gonna show you, keep this just in your, in your, in your mind, I'm going to show you a picture of the projection by Princeton University and NOAA. This is, a, I mean, about 20 models, one of them predict this. So it's a 5% probability, the fat tail. And you just see that this is an exact intensification of what's happening now. Look at this figure, it's happening now. Look at this figure of what could happen, okay? Everything is just getting extreme. So that is what we are looking at, all right? So uh, just to state, I, I want to bring in quoting IPCC in my communities like quoting God, authority, okay? So it says climate change is a threat to human well-being and planetary health. Any further delay in concerted global action, this is the key. It shows, it says adaptation. Before it will only say mitigation. So what does that mean? That is, that is a tacit, uh, I don't want to use the word confession, tacit acceptance by the community, we need to adapt. We're not going to be able to stop this in time. Okay? So adaptation has to go hand in hand with the mitigation. And I completely support that. So let me just give you, uh, so from now on, I'm going to talk, start uh, pivoting to my, the main topic of my talk today, climate resilience, okay? When I say climate resilience, resilience for nature and humanity, both. So how do we define it? I, the, the simplest way, there are multiples of definitions, okay? I think of it as bouncing back. That's why I put this uh, soccer ball there. But the uh, IPCC definition is prepare and plan for, absorb, adapt to climate risks. And I added bounce back. So what are those pumps doing? 2023, that's today. I'm thinking that there's quite a bit of consciousness, you know, let's take Biden's uh, uh, climate plan and Europeans and many nations of China. So things are going to slightly improve, but then we will slip into that one and a half degree warming. That's going to happen no matter what we do, okay, except geoengineering. So then there will be, you know, extremes, things we couldn't uh, adjust to. And I think that will finally raise the conscience of the public, okay? And I'll, talk, I'll give you my definition of the public. As you know, America is divided into two countries, no matter what the issue is, and climate change is one of the issues. And I think we'll improve and why am I putting a dip in 2050? I, I think we are not going to be able to avoid the two degree warming. So things will go down and, and then it will start massive action. We'll bounce back. I'm hoping after 2050, this problem will be solved. And uh, what does that mean? All of you sitting students, you are the ones who are going to implement those solutions beginning 2040, okay? The key thing is the bouncing high back. It's just not we can say there is some mythical planet or mythical government. Each of you, it has to happen at the level of an individual, a community, a city, a state, or a nation. All are, it's an all hands on the deck moment. Okay. But I want you to now think about when I say adaptation and mitigation, we have to put a human face to this. Okay, I will show you a, 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 a gut-wrenching video of what adaptation means. 
So I like to break the, divide the planet into three worlds. They are, they are coexisting side by side and interdependent. This is the top one billion. Most of us are in inhabiting this part of the planet, okay? We are the ones, unfortunately, consuming the most. We are contributing the 1 billion, which is just 15% of the, 12% uh, of the planet's population is contributing 50% of the pollution, okay? Fortunately, we also have the resources to solve the problem. Compare that with the bottom 3 billion, they are forced by powerful poverty to still rely on 18th century technologies. You know, when I turned 70, eight years ago, I went on a sabbatical, lived in villages in India. I went from the South India where I was born to all the way to Himalayas. Here, I am a guest of this uh, family. Uh, it's a Himalayan village. She's just preparing my breakfast for me, my, uh, her husband, and three other kids she has. These bottom three billion live everywhere. Sadly, including America, there are over 20 million. Okay? They contribute only about 5% of the CO2 emissions. This is a question and suggestion I'm going to ask you later. Okay, just keep that in mind. So if the, her home is destroyed with a severe rain, which will be because it's a mud hut, and it's because of climate change, who should pay for her? The loss of home. Us, the top one billion, or she just has to work harder and find a job somewhere in the city to pay for it. These are the questions we are facing. I'm going to show you a video when I did the sabbatical of these two worlds living side by side, okay? It's just a minute and a half, and I may be talking as we go along. I'm starting with, oh, wait a minute. I'm staying in this woman's house, me and my wife, we went together. She's the daughter-in-law of the woman you would see. They are preparing our breakfast. And there's, they have a family of five plus two of the seven. I must tell you, it's the best breakfast I've had in my life. Delicious food. But you see how the smoke is escaping from the huts. And this is middle of the day. Okay, we are back in our times for lunch. That's how we to do Because if any windows, rain will come in. You see those holes? While the girls are preparing all the work, the boys are playing. And this forest has all disappeared because of cutting wood for cooking. Now she's fetching water from the well. What the scene closely. I was so scared when I saw the frog. I thought she's going to put it into my into the food. But fortunately, she filtered the frog out. And see how carefully she has to put both drums because she can't afford to lose even one drop of water that's going to serve seven of us, her family of six and, and, and me. This is three o'clock. The temperature is about 95 degrees. And she, I can't, I didn't show it. She has no sandals. She's just walking barefoot. She has to walk a mile. Think about what adaptation means. What we would do is get, you know, so discouraged living after every week, we'll move to this resort, just in the middle of the village, abundant swimming pool. Now I'm driving back to Bombay, Mumbai, driving through all the slums. There were days I would spend really crying for these people, but it took me a day to travel to this big city. This one guy lives in this whole huge apartment. This is the second, the top world, okay, top one billion. And I check into a five-star restaurant, have a beer. I have completely forgotten about them. That's what happens. That's how we can coexist side by side and, and deny the other world exists. 
So there's another way to look at the top, uh, you know, the three worlds. I talked about the top one billion. I talked to you about the bottom three billion. There is a middle four billion, okay? So this distributes it. What it shows, and you can study this figure, 50% of the world's population is consuming 87% of the CO2. They are contributing. The other 50% have almost no role in this. But we all know instinctively, they are the ones who are going to suffer the most. This issue is just being comprehended and discussed at the United Nations. They call it loss and damages. And I expect it to be one of the most contentious issues. Who pays for the suffering of the bottom 50 billion? Because I travel in a plane, okay? For my vacation, for you know, giving talks. But every time I get on a plane, I know I'm sending a bunch of people to homelessness, okay? So, uh, where do they want to take this rest of the talk? Resilience. So we need to think about just not mitigation, resilience okay, for these three wars. That's the idea I want to drive it. Don't think of this when we say resilience, adaptation, us. We need it too. I'm not denying we don't need it. People lose homes in floods, people lose their lives. There is suffering everywhere, but we need to keep these three worlds uh, distinctive. So resilience first has mitigation because we have to reduce the climate risk, right? Adaptation, what we can't mitigate, we have to adapt to. I am arguing we have to now start adapting to one and a half to two degree warming, okay? But the task involved, the money involved, everything involved is so huge, none of this is gonna happen without societal transformation. That's the new, equation or thing I'm adding here, okay? So how do we def define risk? Think of it as a product of vulnerability and threat. You reduce vulnerability by adaptation. You reduce the threat by mitigation, okay? And reducing vulnerability has Three things, I don't have time to uh, you know, go into uh, blow by blow. If you want, we can, uh, we have to reduce exposure, right? If you're in a fire prone zone, don't have trees that reduce your exposure, your sensitivity, your adaptive capacity, et cetera. The other distinction between mitigation and adaptation I'd like to inform you is that mitigation, we have to think on global scale because emission anywhere is warming everywhere. And uh, therein comes a huge issue about America divided. How do we bring those who have difficulty accepting the climate change issue, how do we bring them into the same tent so that we can unpack everything that divides us, race, culture, gender, and unite on this one uh, problem, okay? Adaptation on the other hand has to happen on an individual to local to regional to global scales. What does adaptation mean to that woman I showed who carried two buckets of water on her head? She needs footwear, sandals. It's just the ground is getting too hot, okay? To you and me, adaptation means would mean totally different things, have a little bit more air conditioning. Likewise, those in the middle 4 billion living in Africa and India or Mexico, they need a fan when it gets too hot. So it's at that scale you have to think about adaptation. Okay. So the rest of the talk, uh, I think I'm pretty coming up. I'm going to give you my personal example of resilience building. What is it I've been doing, okay, uh, through my work? So I have to go through this fast. I started an a effort at UC, all 10 campuses joined called Bending the Curve. 
And in this way, we came with solutions to the climate change problem. But this was nine years ago, right? So I was thinking mainly about mitigation. It's all about mitigation, all right? The field has moved so fast, I think of it as only 15% of the problem. And, uh, and I think uh, Peter mentioned about my work with my two daughters. You can see there are three Ramanathans in the authorship there. We were trying to provide clean cooking to villagers. This is this project we did over 5,000 homes. The problem is, the problem of cooking with solid fuel is easily solvable. Lest of us have figured out, right? But, you know, get electricity, electric cooking or gas. The issue for the poorest is who's going to pay for it? So what we came up at that time is that we give them carbon credit because by not cutting firewood, they're uh, cutting down CO2 emissions. We need to give them carbon credit for that. And we showed how to be done using cell phones, okay? But again, the issue is if she's going to lose her home, who should pay for it? The top one billion because we caused the problem or they have to figure out a way. But if they don't have the money, they're gonna keep cutting the firewood. So what we showed, I'm gonna show you soon, for our own survival, we need to make sure they access clean uh, fuels. So the societal transformation has three components. One is science. You see, our climate models don't have human beings. They're just inanimate stuff. And somebody pulls a lever, hits a button, and, and it cooks results. There is no interaction between the social system, that's human beings, and the natural system. We need to include that. And I'll show you an example of what we did. The second is education. And the third is to unite America on this climate action issue to get public support. Okay, those are. So this is, you know, we, the right hand side, that oval is the climate, traditional climate model. We brought in a human social system model, behavioral change and others. I, I'm not going to go blow by blow. It's published. What I want to show you is what we showed. This is a warming curve projection, not a prediction. It's getting closer to prediction if you bring in human behavior. Shows how the warming will change. Because we could include social systems, we could address three questions with that model. What should society should do? This is what almost 100% of the climate studies are. They just say you should cut the emissions, okay? What we address in the study is how much can society do? Because there is inertia on everything. Inertia in from science to policy, if inertia from policy to technology development, blah, 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 blah. So if then we said, if you explore what society can do, there's no way we can keep the warming below one and a half. The maximum we can do is keep it around two degrees. Even there, depending on how behavior changes, the warming could be with all our mitigation could be as high as two and a half. See, I have a curve with climate justice and without. What do I mean by that? The blue curve is when the top 1 billion provides the financial resources for the bottom 3 billion to switch from cutting wood and coal to uh, renewables. If we don't do that, what our model tells is that they're going to just keep switch to fossil fuels because it'll be available, it'll be cheaper. And that alone would contribute another one degree to the warming. No model I know is looking into this. Later, we finished the study. If we need to do adapt to climate change, again, that's going to require energy, which I don't know of any model which has done except ours. And we showed that could contribute to another degree if we don't help out the bottom three billion. So what emerged from our study by bringing social system is we are so dependent on the poorest 3 billion. They are not just living somewhere. Climate change connects all of us. 
So for our own survival, we need to help out the poorest three billion. And we developed an you know, education. I started a, a bending the curve education program. Our target was educating 1 million climate warriors. We just finished a course for undergraduate. It started in 10 campuses. Now it's taught in uh, Stockholm University and some East Coast campuses. But I really want to take it to the conservative states of America. That's what I'm getting started on. Okay, go to Texas, go to uh, Nebraska, Kansas. I am talking to universities there. And then we started a major uh, effort led by myself and our Dean of Education at UCLA and our California state system. We created this K-12 Eclipse project. It fortunately now, it's a UCCSU that covers 95% of the universities and colleges in California. Uh, they have received huge funding to educate our K-12. Now we are working on Fauna Farm and a social scientist is leading it, the bending the curve for the public private sector. Okay, so everyone needs to be educated. Let me just come to that last topic and then I'll, I'll close. To me, this is the elephant. If there is only one elephant and that's this, on climate actions, how do we unite America? We just don't have the majority. You see what's happening in the Senate. So many compromises have to be made to anything about climate. How can we take uncompromising, unrelenting actions to bend the curve before it exceeds too much beyond one and a half degrees, okay? I got started in this journey when I turned 60 years old, long, long, long time ago, 19 years ago, I was inducted to the uh, Pontifical Academy of Science. It's an amazing institution. And uh, uh, Pope John Paul II, now he's uh, made a saint, personally uh, inducted me to the academy. I know when we talk about Catholic religion, going into all kinds of issues with abortion, this and that, but it's the only religion I know where science and faith can cohabit together. The members are international scope, multiracial in composition, and non-sectarian. Non-sectarian, imagine that. You know, I'm not a uh, Catholic, I'm not an, even a Christian, and there are Jews, and there are people who are, uh, are sort of atheists too in that science academy. So we, we report to the Pope, but we have tremendous freedom. So, there is where my psyche, my genre, my thinking gradually changed that as a scientist, I need to dive into the solutions because this has become an uh, extinction issue. So we organized a meeting, meeting, I teamed up with an economist from Cambridge University, he was also a member, and we briefed Pope Francis, this is 2014, where, you know, in that exchange, the moment they caught the camera, I was telling Pope Francis about the top 1 billion and bottom 3 billion. And he asked me as he was smiling, what is it he can do about it? So I told him at that time that he has become moral leader of the world, you know, far beyond Catholicism, and he should talk about climate change in his preachings. He released a year later, Lauda Tausi, just I think it stands for Our Common Home. He brilliantly summarized everything I told him, and just not me, others, with this one sentence, cry of the earth should be heard with the cry of the poor. I mean, it just, it brings me a lot of emotions every time I read that sentence. So, uh, then we wrote an editorial in Science Magazine. Why you, what I'm asking you, what I'm uh, trying to tell you is that science policy and faith has to come together to bring those who have difficulty with climate science into the fold to solve this issue. So what we said was finding ways to develop a sustainable relationship with the planet requires ultimately a moral revolution 
religious institutions can and should take the lead on bringing about such a new attitude toward creation. Particularly the conservative uh, part of America who are skeptical about climate science are also religious. So I think this, we, we need a non-political forum to talk to them about climate change. I'm arguing churches, synagogues, mosques, temples, give us that uh, forum. So we organized this meeting on climate resilience and we came up with, uh, this was just last year, 22, finally the resilience concept is in the church and Pope Francis released a statement. I'm not going to read all of it. I'll just read the last paragraph. You know, this is a declaration. It's available in our website. I have spoken of an ecological conversion, which demands a change of mentality and a commitment to work for the resilience of people on the ecosystem. That is societal transformation, change of mentality and commitment, okay? So what I'm arguing, I'm going to stop here. I'm going to skip the next two slides, okay? We had to change the narratives. We tried talking about polar bears. We talk, tried talking about glaciers. We tried talking about trees. It worked to persuade half, but we need to bring the other half. It turns out Americans took almost all the environmental regulations for health. So I'm just saying we pivot to physical health and mental health. Okay, and during the question session, if you have some suggestions for how do we change this narrative, uh, it'd be fantastic for me. And pivoting to health has scientific support. I don't know how many of you know, 3.6 to 10 million of us die throughout the world, including US, just from air pollution from fossil fuel burning. Okay, that smoke you see that kills. On top of that, climate and weather extremes has killed 606,000 deaths, 4 billion displaced. The list is enormous. It doesn't stop. And, and this is the study of this kid. We showed people who are exposed to mental health mires, their mental diseases double. The PTSD syndrome is documented by Dr. Jyoti Mishra uh, at UCSD and deep depression increases in severity. So it's just, everything is affecting both our physical health and mental health. Here I list, I'm not gonna go through, I think I, I'm just overextended my time, but it's, uh, in, in, it's with you, uh, kindly see that healthcare professionals have to join us big time, okay? Remember I said, this is an all hands on the deck moment. I'm just giving you, remember this whole part of it, last one third is just what am I doing? I teamed up with an American, famous American composer. Uh, and we won the Pulitzer. And we are saying, how is that? A big orchestra, musicians can come together irrespective of their cultural, racial, and other issues and create music which raises passion in us, okay? And what can we learn from climate change? We're just writing an op-ed. Likewise, on the mental behavior of health, I'm teaming up with Dr. Jyoti Mishra. She's also married to my son. Uh, that when given a choice between short-term quick benefit versus long-term, we always choose short-term. It turns out she's finding there are places in our brain which can be tapped into for long-term benefits. Meaning we have that capability. I'm not talking about manipulating anything. We have that capability to focus on long-term. And how does that, you know, can be brought to bring people to think about the long-term, our children, our grandchildren, and generations unborn. And uh, so there are, infinite scope to solve this issue. I leave with this. And, and students, you're all just getting started on your life. You graduate, then your career, your life starts. I don't want you to get discouraged. I strongly believe there is still time to protect you all and protect yourself. 
but you need to be prepared and you need to be willing to not only have knowledge, but apply that knowledge to solutions. Thank you. We have time for some comments or questions. Was there any, excuse me, was there any like negative feedback from, you know, more religious communities when they found out like the Pope was taking like an environment, environmentally conscious stance, like were people against him sort of taking a more, not modern route, but like sustainable, futuristic sort of situation and diverging less from religion and more to science? Did that, you know, cause any commotion in the Catholic community? I mean, that, that, that's an excellent question. What I found in my personal experience, because after the uh, Laudato C was released in 2015, I went on a sort of a lecture uh, to, to mainly uh, Catholic institutions and evangelical institutions, okay? And this was in places like Nebraska, Villanova in Pennsylvania and Texas and other places and in San Diego too. Uh, my experience was uh, first, no one threw eggs or stone rocks at me. Okay. Instead, the response was invariably, oh, Professor Ram, we didn't know there is so much science behind this. We thought it was all politics, right? So there is a lesson to be learned for all of you. And I asked them, where do you get your knowledge? They don't read New York Times. They don't read, you know, uh, Washington Post. Not many of us read those things too. So where can they get their information? You know, the media is divided, polarized. So uh, I didn't find any resistance from the public, but of course, you know, the politicians and those who have vested interest, there were some statements that if I want to know about climate science, I don't need it from the Pope, okay? But what I tell them is that that Laudato C was reviewed by at least half a dozen of us, including two Nobel laureates in climate science in environment science. So, uh, but let me give you the statistics. Apparently only 5% of Americans or Catholic, American Catholics even know Laudato Si exists, okay? So that's where I'm confused. And, but I feel that it's a huge potential tapped into it. And for that to happen, each one of you have to talk to your parents, your relatives, your community, and to your church. And that's, it's at that level this is gonna happen and be solved. We can't leave it to the politicians because they're just already polarized. Their mind, minds are made up. So the pressure has to come from bottom up. You have another question? Please, yeah. Um, how can development happen, especially in these poor countries, without encouraging environmental injustice, especially since uh, most of the time this development is extremely unsustainable and causes increased emissions and things like that? So how can we support these poor countries to develop in a sustainable fashion without demanding that they don't develop, I guess? Yeah, I think you see, uh, there are two steps here. First, we have to do our part. 
And I, I, I so what, when I when I'm now talking about climate change, so why am I just focusing on American public? I still think America is the only country I know which has that potential to lead the world. But how can you lead the world without setting an example? So uh, we, for the first time since all this movement started, we now have climate mitigation policy, thanks to uh, our President Biden and his administration. I'm worried if that is interrupted next year, the election changes hands. And I don't think the development world, I don't see any hope there. I think you see, if we develop the technologies and we bring the cost down, how do we bring the cost down? Shift some of the manufacturing to developing countries where you know the cost of labor is low. So the globalization would propagate it and uh, the other hope is China, you know, but they are the largest emitter uh, of the planet now, the, currently, but they are also uh, have the maximum rate of growth in uh, renewable technologies, okay? So I see the hope for what you, you're talking about is America taking the lead and bringing down our emissions. Fortunately, for example, you see, few states are taking the lead. In California, uh, the law is passed, but in about seven years time, uh, two thirds of the car we said will be electric, okay? So, and, and transportation is about 40% of our emissions, America's emissions. So the, the and second is, uh, industry and agriculture. On the hopeful side, lots of good things are happening. On the worrying side, are they happening fast enough? And will they be interrupted because of the politics? A question, please. Um. The best way to go about talking to someone who is skeptical of climate change, or what would be your best approach, kind of convincing them that it's an actual issue that needs to be worried about and where action needs to be done? You see, uh, you know, uh, first I'm going to duck your question by saying that's a question for social scientists. I'm hoping more social scientists would work on it. But I'll tell you, uh, you know, I had one slide, I went through it a little bit too quick. There are some uh, British and Canadian social scientists who have published studies on this, and they're basically saying that we have to change the narratives of how we talk about climate change, okay? And that has to be almost based locally on the culture basis, okay? So you say you want to talk to someone. If that someone is worried about economics and jobs, I would talk to them about how it's an opportunity to revolutionize American technology and bring more high paying jobs to America, okay? If on the other hand, you have families and they have children, I would talk to them about their children's future. So there is no, I, I learned one magic message but the thing that unites all of us is public health, not the health of polar bears, not the help of health of species, or not even the health of grandchildren and great-great-grandchildren, but our own health. If you look at why we regulated air pollution in city, you know, states like New York, California, and many others, it's because air pollution was killing people. And that got our attention and they could see it, the, the visible smoke. And then you look at Rachel Carson's DDT, that was probably the most seminal environmental uh, book anyone wrote in actions again about public health. Why did we regulate ozone uh, depleting pollutants? CFCs were banned. 
because of health, because depleting the ozone layer was causing skin cancer. So I think we need to change our narratives. And I must inform you, the traditional stuff like IPCC, climate scientist papers, they're still not, they have not caught on. Well, I've, I don't want to blame them because they focus on the science. But because of this impact between climate change and extreme weather and health, that's one narrative change. But you may all have other narrative changes because you know the people you're talking to. What? So we need to understand what, what where is the culture coming from in the people who are skeptic and address that. So in, in doing some work in rural East Washington and Idaho farmers, we found that a lot of them were A, really liked participating in different sort of scientific things and B, did believe in the effects of climate change like drought and hotter weather because they saw it affect their crops directly. But if we described it as climate change, they would immediately disagree. So they believed in climate change effects, but not an actual climate change. And so my question is how necessary is it for farmers or conservative people who don't like believe in climate change to actually believe in and understand climate change if they may be more receptive to taking direct action through science uh, or through mitigating the actual effects? Yeah, I mean, uh, some of the answers to your question was already in your statement. I think they, the farmers are most immediately affected by one uh, heat stress, right? It evaporates the moisture, drought or flooding. And I've not tried this, but I, I, I'm just gonna speculate. I'm thinking if you show them how all of this have increased by three, four hundred percent in the last twenty-five years, okay, and you ask them what do you think cost it, and so I'm thinking starting that conversation with showing data, not talking about the science, not talking about the cause, but first talking about the effect. And then bring in climate change. I, I, I'm wondering if some doors would open. But the, uh, the, you know, to the student who asked this question, that is where I'm thinking if I can bring in more social scientists into this picture so they can help us. And you see, not only social scientists, I think we need to bring in uh, people involved in uh, commercial advertisements, they know how to address uh, people and make them, you know, buy into things, ideas. So we just need to get out of our box and bring in outside experts into the picture. That was the, the kind of the idea I tried to touch on in my last but one slide where I said I'm co I mean, collaborating with a new composer and a neuroscientist. And uh, the solutions to this problem has gone beyond just natural science. So we need to look elsewhere for those answers. You have mentioned uh, loss, loss of images and how this kind of is this inverse relationship between those who admit versus those who have for the effects of it. How do you see like society and how do we think we should advocate in a way to push for those big emitters to have to kind of address the issue they have caused and face like the global south? Peter, there was a background noise. Can you kindly translate that question to me? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, you had mentioned loss and damages and how this kind of inverse relationship between those who have who admit the most um, 
the effects is felt by those who are meant the least. How do we kind of advocate for um, the global self to have, like to repay them and to help them with their transition to a sustainable future? Yeah, fantastic question. One thing I want to clarify to you, you see, I deliberately, I'm not using the word global south, global north, east, west, because that starts all kinds of political, racial, and other dialogues. Let's not forget uh, what 30 million in America live below the poverty line. Okay? So that's why I put them into this economic class. So that little bit circumvents the, the issue, but I agree with you, more of the vulnerable are living in the so-called global south. How do we do that? It's, it's maybe, that is the political economics economist debate and it's happening. And I wanna give you a clue, only uh, three nations in the last United Nations uh, meeting agreed that the emitters have to pay, the polluters pay. All these three nations were led by women. I don't know if that, there is a message there that we need, we need get more women leaders to address this issue. But it is being discussed and people are slowly seeing the picture. I'm also, I'm also worried it may uh, persuade many nations to back off. They'll say, oh, this is not a problem we can pay. So it may prevent actions on climate change. So that's two sides to that uh, coin there. I have another question. <laughs> Okay, let's um, thank the speaker then.